Hello again, this is Keith Slough from Ambassador Christian College and Christian Fellowship Ministries of the Church of God. Uh, I want to talk to you about the biblical calendar. Uh, people who, now there are churches of God, and by that I don't mean Pentecostal churches, but commandment-keeping churches of God that keep the festivals, such as Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. But today there is confusion about what calendar to use. Now, obviously, when God says the Passover is to be observed on the 14th of the first month, we don't go to January 14th. We'd be in wintertime if we did. When does God's year begin? What calendar should we be using? Should we use the modern-day Hillel post-Talmudic calendar, which is the name they give it, should we use that calendar to observe pa uh, Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles, the three feast seasons of God? Well, many people say that we're supposed to follow the Jews no matter what. No matter what the Jews teach, that's what we're supposed to follow. That's what a lot of people say. Also, there are people that assume that the calendar that we have today is the same calendar that Jesus Christ used and observed the Holy Days on. But uh, even the Jews will say that's not true. Modern-day Jews, modern-day rabbis, call Hebrew University in Israel if you don't believe it, or you can check out the Jewish Encyclopedia, and they will tell you in the Jewish Encyclopedia, written by Jewish scholars, that the modern calendar that the Jews have today to observe Passover on and all the festivals of God is not the same calendar that was used in the first century by Jews and Christians. Not the same calendar. Now, that's not my opinion. That's not something I heard through the grapevine. That's not something I got off the internet. That's just a fact. You can go to Hebrew University and ask them. I called up a rabbi when I did my study of this uh, in 1983. That's been a few years ago now. And I called up a rabbi down in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I said, uh, I want to ask you a question. I'm studying the Jewish calendar. Is the calendar that, that today is being used by Jews and some Christians, is that the same calendars they used in the New Testament? And I asked him, about it, and I asked him several questions about it. And one of the questions I asked, I remember almost verbatim his answer. I said, is the Jewish calendar that we're using today, the modern day post-Talmudic Jewish calendar, did that come out of the Bible? Or is it 100% oral tradition? And that's the way I asked the question. And um, he answered me very explicitly, I mean, no equivocation whatsoever. He said, the modern day, this was a rabbi, an orthodox rabbi. He said, the modern day Jewish calendar is 100% Jewish oral tradition. He said, it did not come out of the Bible. Now, some years ago, when I first was exposed to the Hebrew calendar, I got a booklet <clears throat> from a church with headquarters out in California called The Sacred Calendar. It was written by a man whom I later eventually had the privilege of meeting named Kenneth Herman. And Kenneth Herman wrote this book called The Sacred Calendar. And, and I, I wish I had the copy here to read it to you, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but he made the statement that the, the months of God start with the new moon, with the visible new crescent seen at sundown as coming as seen in Jerusalem. He made that statement. For those of you who have that booklet, and that booklet was reprinted year after year after year. I think the first one came out in the 1950s, maybe. But then they'd take the text that he wrote, and they just update the calendar. Every year they'd put out a new uh, Hebrew calendar for people to observe the festivals on, and then they would take the text that he'd written way back, I guess, in the 50s, and use the same text every year. Many of you have those booklets one after another. Well, I think the last one I got from that church was in the 1980s. It was the exact same text. But here's what it says. God's year begins in the springtime. It does, as we're going to see here in a few minutes. And the months begin with the visible new crescent in the sky. That's exactly how they did it in biblical times. Not only did the Israelites do that, but the Babylonians did it. The Arabs still to this day do that. They go by the little new crescent at sundown, and that begins the month. The lunar month begins with the new crescent, the visible sighting of the new crescent. Now, that's how they did it in biblical times. Kenneth Herman also said in his book, The Sacred Calendar, that 
<clears throat> the uh, the year always started in the spring, but when it began to migrate, they would add a 13th month. He went into a lot of detail. I don't have the booklet right here in front of me, and I haven't read it in a few years. But I remember he basically described exactly how the, the biblical calendar worked. Now, the problem was you turn the page, and then they give you the month of Nisan, which is the Babylonian name for the first month of spring. And the calendar was not the calendar he just described. It would be the same thing as a used car salesman telling you on the telephone, oh, we got this car down here, and it, it, it's, it's a red car, and it's got you know, four in the floor, and it's got this, and it's got that, and all that. And you say, wow, that's the car I want. And so you drive down there, and uh, or maybe you ride your bicycle down there. Anyway, you, when you get down there, you say, where's that car at? And he says, I don't have it. But the car you described, you went in all these details. Well, this one over here, is pretty close to it. No, no. Where's the car you described? That would be false advertising. Well, Kenneth Herman explained in detail how the biblical calendar works. You turn over one page and he gives you a different calendar than what he just described. <clears throat> now, I got a, a, a thing in the mail here just this past week. And it's called The Journal. And it, it's, a, it's a tabloid a newspaper that is sent out to many, many different branches of the Church of God. And by Church of God, I mean the commandment keeping, <clears throat> holy day observing churches of God, and there are various branches. But he went into something like seven or eight different ways that people are observing the holy days now. Uh, number one, you can go by the new moon as seen in the sky at sundown, the actual new crescent, that's one way. Another thing that some people are doing is they're going with the conjunction. Now, let me explain what a conjunction is. The conjunction is when the moon is invisible. You can't see it because the moon is in front of the sun. Now, when it's 100% from the sun, you have a solar eclipse uh, like we had in uh, September. I think it was September of uh, 2017. We had this solar eclipse went all across the United States. That can only happen at the con conjunction at the new moon. But is that the biblical new moon? Some people take that to be the first day of the month. The Hebrew word for that is molad, although that Hebrew word molad nowhere is found in the Hebrew scriptures. It's not there. Kodesh, which means new moon, means it refers to the visible new crescent, is used over and over and over, but the word molad, meaning the conjunction, is not used. So some people go with the molad. So when the conjunction occurs in springtime, they make that day number one of the month of Nisan, or you to use the biblical term, Abib, the name that God gave it, and they count 14 days and they got Passover. Uh, another way that some are doing it now is they're, rather than going by the new moon, they start the month with, of all things, the full moon. Now that's hard to believe. I don't know where anybody comes up with something like that. But they will actually start with the full moon, make that day number one. Now the problem is sometimes you have up to three days when the moon appears to be full. How do they determine the exact day of the full moon? Well, they could call an observatory, and they might be able to find the exact hour when the moon is full of the exact day of those two or three days when the moon is full. I guess they could do that. The question is, how did Israel do it? How did Moses do it in the wilderness with no observatory? Well, they couldn't. There was a lady I met some years ago at the Feast of Tabernacles, and she said, I don't go by the visible New Crescent. I go strictly by the conjunction. I said, well, how do you know when the conjunction occurs? Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> when the moon is in front of the sun, all over the world, there is no moon that, at that time. At the conjunction, now there are two conjunctions per month. You have the conjunction at the new moon when it's invisible. You have the conjunction at the full moon when it's big, round, full moon. But she started with the conjunction at the new moon, but she started with the day of the conjunction. I said, well, how do you know when that is? Now, it's totally invisible, not only in America, but in Russia, in China, anywhere in the world, anywhere you go, you're not gonna find uh, a moon. You go out at night, look, there's no moon because the moon is traveling with the sun. And about two days later, or actually it won't be a full two days, it'll be about the next day after the conjunction at evening, you'll see the, the visible new crescent, which makes the next day 
the day of the new moon, if you're going to buy the new moon itself. But I ask this lady, how can you start the month with the conjunction? She said, Keith, it's the easiest thing in the world. She said, I, I get on the telephone and I call the observatory and they tell me the exact day when it is. And then my question obviously was, well, how did Moses do it without a telephone? How did Israel do it without an observatory out in the wilderness for 40 years? How did they do it once they came into the land without an observatory? You might say, well, it's very simple. You wait till the moon goes completely dark. And when there is no new moon, that must be the day of the conjunction, which means that that would be day number one of the, of the new lunar month. That won't work. It won't work. There are at least two days of darkness when there's no new moon. I mean, there's no moon seen at all and sometimes up to three days of darkness. Now, which one of those two or three days of darkness would be the day of the conjunction? Now, if you're going to keep Passover on the exact right day, you've got to know the exact right day to start the month. All right, you tell me. If you've got only two days of darkness, which one of those two days is the conjunction? Do you know? Now, don't say I'll call the observatory. Moses didn't have a telephone. Do you know what day the conjunction occurs. Now, don't ask me because I don't know. She didn't think, well, wait a minute, how did Moses do it? How did Israel do it? How did Jesus start the month with the conjunction? How did he know? Now, he was Jesus. He had a lot of knowledge, but did he know that? And if he did know it, why didn't he tell us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John how to do it? The question is, how did they do it in biblical times? Well, they did not go by the full moon to start the month. Neither did they go by the conjunction. He said, how do you know that? You can look at a book like Webster's Rest Days, or you can go to the encyclopedia. You could call up Hebrew University in Israel, ask them, or check any history professor who is a student of ancient history. How did they do their calendars in ancient times? They went by that little new crescent in the sky, which is seen just after sundown, 15 to 20 minutes after sundown. In the west, where the sun sets, you'll see that little baby moon. Now, in Jesus' day, and even before, the, the priesthood, uh, they, they had to declare when the month started. So the high priest would, would have at least two, if not three, witnesses. And these men were trained, they, 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 their eyes were trained to see the new moon. They knew how to do it, where to look, and everything. And they would go up on a high mountain there in Jerusalem to get away from the trees, get away from the buildings, where they and they knew right where to look. They were trained observers. And then when they saw the new moon, they would come down and announce it to the high priest. They would blow the trumpet, let everybody know that, hey, the month has started. God said in Numbers uh, chapter 10, I believe it is, that when the at the beginning of your months, I believe it's Numbers 10, 10, you're to blow the trumpet to let people know the, the month has started. So you might be sitting in your house with your family and you'd hear the trumpet sound and you didn't see the new moon, but you know it's been declared from Jerusalem, good enough. But they didn't declare it arbitrarily, just, hey, flip a coin, let's make today the first day of the month. They had to actually observe the new crescent. That's how it was done in Jesus' day. If that had been the wrong way to do it, then Jesus should have told us. However, when people say that the conjunction starts the month, when people say the conjunction starts the month, when these observers went up on top of the mountain, what were they looking for? If the conjunction, which is the invisible moon, starts the month, what were they looking for? Did they come down from the mountain and announce to the high priest, Hooray! Guess what? We didn't see anything. Whoopee! We didn't see the moon. No, that's dumb because there are two, sometimes three days of darkness. That would have been stupid. You know what they were looking for? The little new crescent. A lunar cycle starts with the baby moon, the new crescent. It begins to mature in about five days. Well, from the conjunction to be a full seven, but you're looking from the time you see the the actual new crescent, in about five days, it's going to be full. About another seven days, uh, it's going to be half, excuse me. And then about another seven days after that, it's going to be a full moon. And once it reaches its full mature state, then the moon 
begins to wane. The waxing moon is when it's getting bigger and bigger every night. After the full moon, it's called the waning moon, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it totally disappears one morning at sunrise, and now you know that you're near the conjunction. It's either that day or the next day or possibly two days later. So what did they look for when they went up on the mountain? They looked for the new crescent. The lunar cycle goes from the beginning that the crescent is seen until it's over and done with and until the next new moon is seen. That's the whole lunar cycle. Now, in an average of 12 months, a lunar cycle from one new crescent to the next is on average 12 days, uh, I'm sorry, 29 days, excuse me, 29 days, 12 hours, uh, 44 minutes and 2.8 seconds. That's the average lunation, the average time from one new moon to the next, from one, one crescent to the next, 29 days and 12 hours, so about 29 and a half days, which means that in a period of, of 12 months, you're going to average one month having 30, another month having 29. The next month will have 30, maybe. You can have up to three months that have 29 days in them, and you can have several months that have 30 uh, days equal. I mean, one after another, 30, 30, 30, then 29, then 30, 30, then 29, 29, 30. It's not 30, 29, 30, 29 all the way through. Now, Hillel apparently started these full and defective months in the fourth century. Uh, from the research I've done, they're not exactly sure when the full and defective months were brought into the modern Jewish calendar. But eventually they said, well, there are a total of um, 354 days in a lunar solar year, which means that you're going to average six months with 30 days and six months month with 29. So let's just make up a calendar and make one month have 30 and one month have 29. But in the biblical calendar, going by the new moon itself, you may have two or three months in a row of 30-day months. And then you may have two or three months that may be 29-day months. So it's not always 30, 29, 30, 29. But it's going to average six months having 36 months having uh, 29 days. When you, average, when you add that up, it's 354 days. So the way they did it in Jesus' day, now this is history. This is just historical, documented fact. Again, call Hebrew University in Israel if you don't have access to a Jewish encyclopedia. But the way they did it, the way Babylon did it, the way Egypt did it, the way the Arabs did it, ancient cultures, so far as I know, they all did it this way. Even Persia, which is modern-day Iran, the way they did it was they went out and they looked at the new crescent. And when the new crescent was seen, they started the month. That's just a matter of history. <coughs> Excuse me. So, is that not the way we should keep God's holy days today on the calendar that Jesus would have used? The calendar that God gave to Israel? The calendar that God gave to, to Moses? Isn't that the calendar that we ought to be using and not some man-made calendar that we came up with. Now, the information I'm going to give you now came from uh, a man whom I had a lot of respect for, a lot of people considered him to be a scholar, Dr. Herman L. Hay. Uh, Dr. Hay had studied the Jewish calendar quite a bit, and he wrote an article which came out in a magazine called The Good News about 1981. And, it, and the title of the article was uh, The Hebrew Calendar for God's Church Today, or words to that effect. And he explained the history of the modern Jewish calendar. And he explained how that in the 4th century, the Samaritans were sending up smoke signals a day earlier than the Jews did sometimes to confuse people. When they would see the new moon, they would send up smoke signals. Now remember, they blew the trumpets in Jerusalem, but what about people farther away? So they would send up a smoke signal, which was seen by somebody way over there, and then they'd send up one for the people on the other side. But, but what happened was the Samaritans were always at odds with the Jews. So they began to, to confuse the matter, and it made the Jews really mad, and they were at each other's throats, and so it was messing up Pax Romana, the, the Roman peace. They were about to have war, so uh, the, the government of Rome, the Roman Empire, went to the Jewish leader at that time, whose name was Hillel II, and they said, you've got to come up with a whole new calendar that does not depend on observing the new moon. You've got to come up with a whole new calendar, because otherwise you guys are going to be fighting all the time. So, under duress, he didn't want to do it, he had to create a different calendar than the one found in Scripture. And so what he did was he knew the mathematical approximation of 354 days averaged out to 
30 days and six months and 29. So he just set up a calendar uh, that did not depend upon <coughs> upon them seeing smoke signals or, or even observing the new moon. Now that was called the Talmudic calendar. It replaced the calendar found in the Bible. And that went on for some years. And then over the centuries, additional rabbis added more things to the Hillel calendar with various uh, addenda and embellishments until they finally got it the way they wanted it in around AD 800. Around 800, they finalized the Jewish calendar. That is now called the post-Talmudic calendar, and that's the one that Jewish people use today. And so many churches of God that follow the Holy Days use that calendar. Primary, most of them do. But there are questions about, well, how should we... Now, should we use the, 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 the modern-day post-Talmudic calendar? Some people say, well, Romans 3 says that God gave the oracles to the Jews, so what are the Jews tell us that's what we're supposed to do? Oracles does not mean oral tradition. Look it up in Greek. I read Greek. The word there is the same word that refers to the written words of God from Genesis to Malachi. If it had referred to oral traditions, the Greek word would have probably been rhema, which means the spoken word. But logos means the written word. And here's plural, logon, I believe, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And it means the words of God, the written words of God. Well, now, what written words do the Jews preserve? Genesis through Malachi. And so those scriptures, those words of God, are what the Jews have preserved for us today. The oral traditions, well... I wouldn't put too much stock in that because in, in uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 7 through 9 and verse 13, Jesus Christ told the Jews, you have laid aside God's commandment in order to hold to your own tradition. Folks, they've done the same thing with the Jewish calendar. They got rid of the biblical calendar and substituted their own. Now, it wasn't all their fault that Roman government... Uh, pressured Hillel to create a whole new calendar, and in that day and time, they would have killed you if you didn't. And so this was around the middle of the 4th century, around 358 to 359 A.D., he created a whole new calendar called the Talmudic calendar. Later on, they changed it, made some modifications. It evolved, it developed. Now they call it the post-Talmudic calendar. Now, if you have access to the Jewish Encyclopedia and look up the word calendar, you're going to find that according to Jewish scholars, the Jews have had three calendars in their long history from the time they came out of Egypt until today. Three different calendars. Which one of those three calendars should we keep the holy days on? Well, I'm going to give you the names of those three calendars according to this most reputable scholarly source, the Jewish Encyclopedia. The third, I'm going to start with number three. The third calendar that's the modern calendar is the Hillel post-Talmudic calendar, which is totally man-made and uninspired by the Jews' own acknowledgement and admission. That's number three. Should we keep the holy days on that calendar? What's the one before that? They called it the Talmudic calendar or the Hillel calendar. Should we keep the holy days on that calendar? Now, the first calendar, number one in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Now, this, I know these are strange names. I didn't come up with these names. These are names that the Jews themselves came up with, Talmudic, post-Talmudic. Now, this first calendar, the Jews come up with a really strange name for it. It's called the Biblical Calendar. Why would they call that calendar the Biblical Calendar? Because it's the calendar found in the Bible. Now, I do this with my students when I teach the, the, uh, the Hebrew calendar, and I teach it in the doctoral class. We have four different degrees offered at Ambassador Christian College, and I teach uh, one on the Hebrew calendar, and I do it in the doctoral class. And I put these three names on the board, on the dry erase board behind me, and I, and I, I just say, now, if I have, if I, if I have you to tell me, when I write these on the board, to tell me which one of those calendars we should observe God's holy days on, if you have five seconds that you had to guess, with no information except for the names themselves, which calendar do you think we should do God's holy days on? 
Every one of them, 100% of them, if they have to make a decision just like that, will pick number one, the biblical calendar. But listen, the biblical calendar is different than the Talmudic, and the Talmudic is different than the post-Talmudic. they are three different calendars. The first one is truly the sacred calendar because it comes out of the Bible. The second one is totally man-made by Hillel. Now, he... He created a calendar that mathematically approximates the biblical calendar, but it's not the same one. If you go by Hillel's calendar, you will be at least two days off just about every year, sometimes only one day off and sometimes a full month off from the biblical calendar, a full month. I can't remember all the different things that that uh, newspaper said that people were doing now. But some people go by the full moon, some people go by the conjunction, some go by the new crescent moon as they did in biblical times. Uh, <clears throat> there are, <coughs> let's see, there's one guy came up with, let's just have a 52-week calendar and just don't pay attention to the new moon at all. And then, of course, you can go by the modern-day post-Talmudic calendar, which approximates but does not exactly start the month with the new moon. How should we do it? Now, let's, let's assume that you're like Robinson Crusoe. And you're stranded on an island somewhere, and there's nobody to talk to, there's no television, there's no radio, and there are no books to read. And you're there all by yourself, but there's plenty of food to eat. You know you're going to be there for years and years to come. After a few weeks, an airplane flies by and drops a box out. They just throw this box out. And in that box, they don't know you're down there. They drop this box that falls on the beach, and you go out there and look at it, and it's got different stuff in it. But they also have a Bible in it. And it's the only book in the entire box. So you're thinking, well... I've got nothing else to do. I don't have anything else to read. No TV, no radio, nothing. So I'll just sit here and read this book for entertainment. As you begin to read the Bible with no understanding of Jewish tradition whatsoever, just the Bible, you're going to find a very easy way to keep God's holy days if you wanted to. Let's say you decide I'm going to live by this. There's no church out here to tell me to do it differently, so I'm going to just do what this says. So you'd come to Exodus chapter 12. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It, this month, shall be the first month of the year to you. Now the word translated month here, is the word Kodesh, which is translated again and again and again as new moon. It can be translated new moon or month, depending on the context. When you go <coughs> from one new moon to another, you've gone from one month to another. We're told in Numbers 10.10 10, that we start the months, the, the beginning of our months, it starts with the new moon. In fact, the word there that's translated month is the same word as new moon as it is here. This could be translated, this new moon shall be to you the beginning of new moons. It shall be the first new moon of the year to you. Or you could translate it month, because from one new moon to the next new moon is going from one month to the next month. Numbers 28, 11, in the beginning of your months. And the word there for month is kodesh, new moons. So the, the, uh, the word kodesh can be translated new moon or month. In 1 Chronicles 23, verse 31, it's translated as new moon. And there are a lot of places where it's translated as new moon. Now, God said, this new moon will be the first, will be the beginning. Now, if you look in your margin by the word first month here, it tells you, if you have a good center reference margin, it says April. Now, how do we know that the margin is correct? Because when you look at Exodus 9.31, it talks about the agriculture that was going on, about the flax was bold, meaning it was in the bud, budding stage, and it talks about the barley and the flax and, and the wheat and so on. And that period of time that's described in Exodus 9.31 describes the first two weeks of April. <clears throat> Certainly not September, but it'd be April. Now verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel and say, in the tenth day of this month, the month of, that God calls Abib, they're to take a lamb, bring it to their house. And then <clears throat> Verse uh, 6, in the 14th day of this month, you're to kill that lamb. Now, we're not killing the lamb because there's no temple today. But how do you know how to keep this if you don't know when the first day is? Uh, verse uh, 14, you're to keep this lamb. I'm sorry, it says you're to keep the feast 
by an ordinance forever. Verse 15, seven days you're eating unleavened bread and so on. But how do you know when to start that? Well, you have to know when the new moon is. Now, <clears throat> if you think that the modern Jewish calendar is the same as the biblical calendar, let me ask you this question. Because I was a teenager when I first got that booklet, The Sacred Calendar, written by Kenneth Herman. I noticed the names of the months. Nisan, Er, Sivan, Tammuz, Ab, Elo. Wait a minute, Tammuz? Tammuz is the name of the fourth month, counting from spring. And I wondered, why would God's sacred months be named after pagan gods? Aren't we told in the Torah, don't mention the names of other gods? Don't even let them be known, mentioned in your mouth, obviously in reference to as if they were real beings, in the context as if they were real. But why would God name his sacred calendar after pagan gods? One of the statements that Mr. Herman made in his booklet, The Sacred Calendar, when you look at our Roman calendar, January, February, March are named after pagan gods. J January named after the two-faced god called Janus. Uh, and then March obviously named after the god of war. May named, May was for Maya or Maya, a goddess. June, Juno, a goddess of fertility. Then you have some of the months named after pagan emperors like July for Julius Caesar, August for Augustus Caesar. Obviously, Mr. Herman says, our Pay, our calendar has to be pagan because it's got pagan names on it. Well, what do you do with the Jewish calendar? Now, when I did my research back in 1983, I had the Encyclopedia Britannica, the world's number one encyclopedia, and I looked up calendar, and I found out the Babylonian months had the same names, Nisan, E-R, Sivan. The only difference was in the spelling. They had a little letter U after each one, Nisan, U, Sivan, U, or E-R, U, Sivan, U, and so on. But, but the months on the Jewish calendar are exactly the same as those on the uh, Babylonian Jewish are, are, are identical. So that's why after they came out of Babylon, they stopped calling the first month Abib. They started calling it Nisan because that was the Babylonian name for the first spring month. Hmm. When I was in high school and I was studying the calendar, I, I met a young Jewish boy. His last name was Cohen. I still remember very well. He had a little thing he wore around his neck, a little... A little, and a little something on it. He said, I can only take this out on the Day of Atonement or on Yom Kippur. And so he, he grew up in the synagogue. I guess he attended the synagogue regular, in a regular way. And so I said to him, I said, you know, I've been studying your calendar, which I thought I had. I've been reading the Bible, and I found out that unlike our calendar that starts in, in January, your calendar starts in the springtime. He looked at me and said, no, it doesn't. I said, well, yeah, it does. Your, your calendar, the Jewish calendar, starts in springtime. He said, no, it doesn't. He said, it starts in the autumn. Boy, I was confused. I said, now, wait a minute. How can your calendar start in the autumn when the Bible says in Exodus 12 that it starts in the springtime? He said, I don't, his exact words, I mean, this is verbatim quotation. He said, I don't care what the Bible says, the Jewish calendar starts in the autumn. Now, that should have told me and should tell every one of you that the modern-day Jewish calendar and the biblical calendar are two different calendars. The Jewish calendar starts in the autumn. It has pagan names for its months. It was invented by Hillel in the 4th century, in the mid-4th century, later embellished by other rabbis. It is not the biblical calendar. Which calendar should we be keeping God's holy days on? Think about it. Now you may say, well, God gave the oracles to the Jews. So we're supposed to do everything they say. Uh -uh, no, that word oracle refers to the written words. We're to do what the written words are. Jews preserve the Old Testament to this day. But Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 1, he said, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, you do what they tell you to do because they were teaching to obey the Torah. He said, but don't follow their example. Don't do after their ways. Don't do what they do. Do what they teach, but don't do what they do because they say, they say one thing, and do not. So when they sat in Moses' seat, they said, we need to obey the law of Moses. But then they turned around and did something else. Should we follow the modern-day Pharisees? I know a gentleman. He's an Israeli. He's not a Christian. He's Jewish. Lives in Israel. And uh, 
he made the statement, I've talked to him on a number of occasions, had some private meetings with him, and he said that his father was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Orthodox. Not Reformed, but you know, real, the strictest uh, of, of the Jewish religion, the, of Judaism. Uh, the Orthodox Judaism is the strictest, and his dad was a rabbi of the Orthodox Jewish religion. He said, did you ever wonder what happened to the Pharisees in the Bible? Because they had Pharisees. This is what happened to them. They became modern-day Orthodox rabbis. He said, so modern rabbis today are the modern-day Pharisees. Now, Jesus said, don't follow them. And yet that's what you're doing if you're keeping the holy days by the modern calendar. So how was it done in biblical times? It's very simple. They went out and looked at the new moon in springtime. And when they saw the new moon, now they'll see it at Sunday. When does the day begin? Remember uh, Leviticus 23, from evening to evening shall they celebrate your Sabbath? Well, that's true because every day starts at sundown. So <clears throat> on the first day of the week, first day of the week doesn't start at midnight. On, on the biblical calendar, it starts Saturday evening at sundown, goes to Sunday evening sundown. Most of us know that. So... The days begin at sundown. When does the month begin? With the first day of the month. Well, if the days begin at sundown, then the month starts at sundown when the new moon is seen. So you need both the sun and the moon to determine when you begin the month. In fact, the same thing is true of the year. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, the expanse, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And it said he made two great lights, the moon and the sun. Now, when does the moon and the sun come into play in beginning uh, the year? They, they let them, the sun and the moon, be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let's just... We know that when the sun sets, that's when the day ends and the next day begins, the 24-hour civil day. The equinoxes, the tilt of the earth to the sun, the equinoxes and solstices determine the four seasons. But what about a year? <clears throat> the year is determined when the sun is in the uh, what the Hebrews call the tekufa. Now, we have four words in English for the beginning of the season. Two equinoxes, I say four words, we got two words, but we, we have two different equinoxes, autumn and spring. We have two different solstices, winter and summer. So uh, the, the, we have the vernal equinox in spring, then we have the summer solstice, and we have the autumn equinox, and then we have the winter solstice. But the Jews have one word for the beginning of each month. They call it the tekufa. That's the Hebrew word. Now, where did I learn that from? Arthur Spear, who wrote the Comprehensive Hebrew Calendar. You can find it in a public library like I did. Read the introduction. He'll explain to you that the Tekufa simply means the equinox or the solstice, depending on which one you're looking at. The vernal equinox is the equinox in spring, and the year began when the earth was at the Tekufa, when it's tilted a certain way, when it's exactly, um, well, I'm going to get into too much math here, but when the earth is actually when, when the sun is exactly on the equator now in winter time it's going to be it's going to be at the sun will be at 90 degrees to the tropic of uh, cancer and uh tropic of capricorn excuse me and then the other season in summertime is going to be at the tropic of tropic of cancer anyway tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn is the solstices when the sun is at 90 degrees to the equator that's both the vernal equinox and the autumn equinox so when, when the earth is tilted in a certain way and the sun is directly on the equator, then that's when you have the, the first day of spring, if it's, the, if it's in springtime. You have, the, you have the first day of spring, the first day of autumn, when it's on the equinox. Now, I don't want to get too complicated, but, but that's how we know when God's year begins. It begins in springtime at the time of the vernal equinox. Now, somebody is going to say, well, the vernal equinox is never mentioned in Scripture. No, you won't find that term in the King James Bible. But the word tekufa is used. It's definitely used. Let's see here. 
<clears throat> now listen to this. Exodus 34. Verse 18, the Feast of Unleavened Bread you shall keep. Verse 22, and you shall observe the Feast of Weeks. That's Pentecost. The first fruits of wheat harvest and the Feast of End Gathering at the year's end. That'd be the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. At the year's end. In Hebrew, that's the word tekufa. Now, for those of you who observe these festivals, you know that the Feast of Tabernacles is in the seventh month on God's biblical calendar. If that is at the Tekufa, and it is, it's in autumn, the Feast of Tabernacles occurs at around the time of the autumn equinox. Now, if that's in the seventh month, do the math. Count backwards. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Six months earlier, the month of Abib also begins at the time of the vernal equinox. Now, if you don't understand that, ask your six-year-old. He can explain it to you because you're in the seventh month in autumn. Count backwards. Six months brings you to springtime. And since it mentions the Tekufa here in Hebrew, the autumn Tekufa happens six months later in the around the time of the beginning of the seventh month. So you count backwards six months and you come to Abib. And so Abib first, which is the biblical New Year's Day, the biblical New Year will occur at the time of the spring Tekufa, what we call the vernal equinox. So there's no way to get around that. I mean, it's so plain. It's so easy to understand. This Jewish fellow that I met when I was in high school studying this thing, he said, our calendar starts in the autumn. And I knew the, the biblical calendar started in the spring. That should have told me then that we're keeping the holy days on the wrong calendar. Well, a few years later, I went to um, uh, our church college there in East Texas, and I talked to a man there who was training to be a rabbi in the Orthodox Jewish religion. He learned about Jesus uh, from apparently the 70 weeks prophecy and came into our Church of God, which had a worldwide membership and I'm not mentioning the name of the church, but anyway, uh, we had churches all over the world, and we were keeping God's festivals. And he told me, because I asked him, I mean, this was just, I was 21 when I went to college. So this was three years later, and I said, how do we know our calendar is right? He said, Keith, there's not enough information in the law to tell us how to, how to observe the holy days. We know we're supposed to do it on certain months, but we don't know how to figure that out. So we, we are, we're dependent upon the Jewish calendar. He told me that sitting in the cafeteria. Later on, we were down there uh, and on the other side of the campus. We were standing outside the classrooms. And I remember very well, he told me, he said, we know for a fact that the Jewish calendar is in error. Now remember, he had synagogue training. He had gone to rabbinical schools. He was just before being ordained as an Orthodox rabbi in Judaism. And then he, he accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord say that came into the church. But yeah, he stood there and told me because he'd had all this training. He said, we know the Jewish calendar is wrong. I said, well, why don't they change it? He said, who's going to do it? Well, isn't there somebody in Israel that could change the Jewish calendar? He said, no. He said, there is no authority. The, Jew, the, the Israeli government doesn't have the authority to change the calendar. I said, what about the rabbis? He said, well, in ancient Israel, the Sanhedrin were the the authorities, that they were the only ones that could make such sweeping changes. And there is no Sanhedrin. There hasn't been a Sanhedrin since the first century. So, I mean, the first, in Jesus' day, the Sanhedrin was operating at the temple, but then the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. The Sanhedrin tried to stay together some years after that, but eventually they dissipated. There was nothing for them to do. He said, so until they create a new Sanhedrin, we are stuck with this modern Jewish calendar, and we know that it's off. Huh. So here I am, about age 21, very new, trying to keep these festivals according to the Bible, because in the New Testament, the early true church of God did keep these festivals. Jesus kept them. He's our example. First Peter 2.21, we're supposed to follow in Christ's steps. So here I'm trying to do this, and yet he's telling me the calendar's wrong. An Orthodox Jewish rabbi, just before he was uh, ordained as a rabbi, is telling me, we know the Jewish calendar is wrong. And there's nobody to fix it. He said, but eventually, when they create a new Sanhedrin in Israel, we will then have enough people, we will then have enough 
authority in Israel to start a new calendar. He said, and then they can make the changes that need to be made. In the year 2004, in the year 2004, a new Sanhedrin was created in Israel for the first time since the days of the New Testament. A Sanhedrin was formed. Now, I went on their website uh, oh, a couple of years ago, and I was reading their comments about the calendar. They acknowledged that the modern Jewish calendar is in error. And here's what they said. They made this statement. They said, we know it's in error, but we're not going to change it until we rebuild the temple. And they're planning to do that. When we rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, at that time, we will then change the calendar. Why do they absolutely have to change the calendar and go back to the biblical calendar? Well, once the temple's rebuilt, and they've already selected the high priest, by the way. Did you know that? They've already selected a, a, a person who traces his ancestry back through the Levitical priest, and they have the registry and everything, so they've already selected the man to be the high priest. Now, you remember from Leviticus 16, the high priest is required to go into the temple, and there's one room that only he can go into, and that's the Holy of Holies. And he can only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. The Jews, according to Josephus and other, uh, I think, other Jewish historians, this is not the Bible, but, but secular Jewish history records that they would tie a rope around the old boy's ankle. So when he went in there, if he wasn't quite right or they had somehow made some kind of a mistake and God struck him dead with lightning, they could just pull him out because they couldn't go in there after him. So he had to walk in there with a rope around his ankle. When they rebuild the temple, they're going to have a Holy of Holies. They don't even need the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't have it in Jesus' day, but they still had that Holy of Holies, that room where the Ark was supposed to be. And so every year on the Day of Atonement, in Jesus' day, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. I don't know what all he did in there, but he was required to go in there once a year. What if he went in on the wrong day? The, the modern-day Sanhedrin has already determined that they're going to go back to the biblical calendar. So when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, it will for sure be the 10th day of the 7th month. They'll have the exact right day. Today, the, the, the Day of Atonement can be one or two days off and sometimes an entire month off. If you were the high priest, would you want to go into the Holy of Holies on the wrong day? So you see they have to change it. My question is, why don't they go ahead and change it now? Well, it'd be inconvenient, and there's no real need, and everybody's already adjusted to the post-Talmudic calendar. Let's just leave well enough alone. But as Christians, we shouldn't be following the Jews. What did Jesus say in Luke 4, 4? Man is not to live by bread alone, but what? But every word of God. Now, they took that out of the NIV and some of the modern translations, but I've read it in the original Greek, and the King James is based on the original Greek. Live by every word of God. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, <clears throat> we should be going by this. So how do we figure out when the calendar is? Let me give you, let me tell you how simple it is. I can explain the rules of the calendar. By the way, this gentleman who was training to be a rabbi and became a Christian, he told me there wasn't enough information in the Hebrew Bible or in the Torah. He was wrong. Let me show you how simple it is. Let's see, that's what they had told him in rabbinical school. Let me tell you what the Bible says. <clears throat> God said, here in Exodus 12, when you see the new moon, that begins the month. You count 14 days, that's Passover. Well, how do you know when trumpets is? Very simple. It's the seventh new moon or the seventh month. Now, let's see here. Leviticus 23, 23. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel in the seventh month. And that word can be translated new moon. In the seventh new moon, counting from spring, and the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of trumpets. Do no serve by work. That's speaks of trumpets. Well, the day of atonement is nine days later on the tenth day, and so on. There are only two new moons that anybody has to observe on the biblical calendar. The new moon of spring and the new moon of autumn. Now, here's how the modern-day Jews do it. The modern-day Jews, 
start with the molad of Tishri. Molad means conjunction, but that word's never used in Hebrew. And they make that the, the, the Feast of Trumpets. They make that day, day number one of the seventh month. Unless, of course, it falls on a Sunday or a, or a Wednesday or a Friday. And, and that would cause the Day of Atonement to be too, would fall on a Friday or a Sunday. So they have to postpone it. Now, also, let's say the conjunction occurs on a, on, a, on a Thursday, which is perfectly okay. But what if the conjunction occurs after lunchtime? Well, they have an arbitrary Jewish rule that you have to postpone it two days. But then that would put it on Friday. That wouldn't work. So then they postpone it another day so it comes on Saturday. So they arbitrarily postpone the festivals. And if we can do that, why come we can't postpone the weekly Sabbath? Just one day. It's only one day's difference pretty close or should we do it exactly the way the Bible says so if we go by what the Bible says we see the new moon of spring that's day one count 14 days count seven new moons that's the feast of trumpets folks that's how easy it is that's exactly how easy it is now I told you there were 354 days if you have a lunar solar year obviously 354 days is 11 days short of the calendar year that we use, the solar year from when the earth is going around the sun. So that means that every every year you're going to be off 11 days. That's why calendars have always had an intercalary month. They had a leap year every two to three years with a leap month. Now, in our strictly solar calendar, we have one day every four years, but when you're going by the lunar solar calendar, you're off by 11 days. That means in two years, you're off 22 days. You're, you're starting the month earlier. And then in three years, you're 33 days off. So you're one whole month off. So at the end of three years, you add one month. And sometimes it can be even two years. But when the new moon came, when it started, when the 12th month ended before the Tekufa, they added, that wasn't the, the new moon. They went to the next new moon, the first new moon of spring, which meant that that year had 13 months. They always started the new moon of spring. The rabbi that I talked to in Charlotte, I asked him about that. He said, let me pull this book off my shelf. And he was reading to me verbatim from this Jewish reference. He said, according to this, in biblical times, before the new uh, post-Talmudic calendar was invented, he said they had to have gone with the first new moon after the vernal equinox, technically starting with the first day of spring, but not before the vernal equinox. It, it, now, here's the thing. Let me say this in the time I've got left because I've got to finish here in just a few minutes. How do we know when they add the 13th month? Now, we know that in autumn, that occurs at the Tekufa. We also know that Abib first begins at the spring Tekufa. We know that. But there are three possible new moons to start the year with, to start Abib first. The last new moon of winter, the first new moon of spring, or the nearest new moon. Now, if you always start with the last new moon of winter, uh, the problem is you could, have, you're, you could start the year as early as February 22nd which means that the wave sheaf would be two weeks later during Passover, and there wouldn't be enough barley in the field to offer. Now, we don't offer barley because the, only the Levites did that at the temple, but, the, but the, the calendar has to be set up in such a way where there will be enough barley. There won't be if you go with the last new moon winter. Well, what about the nearest new moon? That sounds pretty good. One year, the nearest new moon was actually the 19th of March. The, new, the, the vernal equinox, first day of spring, starts on March 20th. The Karaites in Israel went out into the field to see if there was enough barley to offer, and they said, there's not enough barley. So they said, we've got to add a 13th month, even that close. You can't always go with the nearest new moon. Now, for those of you who know that the crucifixion was on April 25th in the year AD 31, that was a Wednesday, look at when the new moon occurred. It was April 12th in the year 31. Now go back to the other new moon, the last new moon that occurred in March. It was the closest new moon. In Jesus' day, they didn't go with the nearest new moon to the vernal equinox. They went with the first new moon after the vernal equinox. There's another problem, too, with going with the first new moon. I mean the nearest, the nearest new moon. If you go with the nearest new moon, what happens when the new moon Let's say that the 12th month ends on March the 5th and the next new moon is March the 6th. That's exactly 15 days from the Tekufa or the equinox and you have 15 days on the other side. Which new moon is the nearest? And I've actually seen that happen. I've actually seen the new moon 
come on March 6th. When that does happen, there is no nearest new moon that year. So what do you do, flip a coin? No. But if you, and another thing too, there's not always enough barley if you go with the nearest new moon. But if you go with the first new moon after the vernal equinox, there will always be enough barley that a hypothetical uh, Levitical uh, priest in Israel could offer the barley. Now remember when Jesus comes back and the temple is set up again, they're going to be offering the wave sheaf and they have to go with the first new moon after the vernal equinox, beginning with and after but not before, in order to have enough barley. So that's the calendar they're going to be using at that time. So it's very, very simple. Don't worry about how many days there are in the month. Don't worry about how many months there are in the year. Don't worry about it. Why? Because as long as you start the year with the first new visible new crescent in springtime, if you always do that, some years you'll have to add a 13th month. A lot of years you don't. But what I'm saying is in a period of 19 years in a metonic cycle, there will be seven leap years in a period of 19 years. Seven. Not always the same seven. It differs from year to year. And so there will be a few years where after two years you have to add a 13th month. But just remember, don't worry about that. Just go with the first new moon of spring. Count 14 days, there's Passover. That is how simple it really is. So when we observe the Feast of Trumpets this year and every year, we're looking at the seventh new moon, the visible new crescent, counting from this past spring. That's how we know when to keep the Feast of Trumpets. And, of course, the Day of Atonement is on the 10th day. The Feast of Tabernacles is on the 15th day. How do we know when to keep Passover? We go to the Tekufa, the vernal equinox, and then the next new moon that falls after March 20th, and sometimes it can't even fall on March 20th, which is very rare, but the first new moon after spring begins, that's Abib the first. That's New Year's Day. 14 days later, you got Passover. Folks, it is so simple that a six-year-old child could figure it out. Now, if you go with the post-Talmudic calendar, there are so many postponement rules. There are so many delays and all these rules that they have got that, that even a, a rabbi probably cannot off the top of his head tell you how to figure it out. He'd have to go get a book off the shelf and read it to you. But if all you do is go by the Bible, it's real simple. I've got about two minutes left. Let me uh, mention Deuteronomy 16.1. The King James says, observe the month of Abib. The word there is Kodesh, meaning new moon. And it says, observe the month of Abib. Well, we don't observe a month. We observe a new moon. And, oh, look, there's a month. No, it's, it, it means that you're looking at a new moon. Observe the, the new moon of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord. So you, you don't keep the Passover on the new moon. So why do you observe the new moon and keep the Passover? Because God doesn't want you just to use a, a, an arbitrary mathematical calculation. God wants you to look at the new moon, the little visible new moon, so you'll know how to count 14 days. And if you have problems with that, you can take your shoes off. You know, 14 is not hard to figure out. So you count 14 days and you keep Passover. So observe the new moon. You don't go by the Molad Tishri as the Hillel post Talmudic calendar does. You don't do that. You go with the new crescent in springtime. And here it says, observe the new moon of Abib. Don't observe the Molad Tishri, which is the conjunction in the autumn. How they figure out which uh, new moon. I guess they use with the nearest new moon to the conjunction. Uh, to uh, the nearest. They don't even go by the new moon. They go by the conjunction. I guess they go with the nearest conjunction to the autumn equinox. I don't know exactly how to do it. But if we do it what God says, we do it exactly the way God says, we observe the new moon of Abib in springtime. Now, one final thing. Does there have to be barley in Israel to start the calendar? What, in a, what about in a time of famine or drought? Remember Elijah had a three-year famine? There was no barley. What about Moses in the wilderness? For 40 years, there was no barley. So how did they know when to start the year? They didn't go out and look at the barley like the modern-day Karaites do in Israel. They looked at the new moon. What about Noah when he was on the ark for over a year? How did he know when to start the new year because the, the, the flood ended. Remember, he got off the ark, what was it, the, uh, second, in the second month? So how did he know when the first month started? He couldn't examine the barley. He went by the new moon. So Abib means green ears, referring to the green ears of barley, but it will approximate. In other words, God's year 
should start when the barley normally would be in the field, but it doesn't have to be in the field to start the year. Moses for 40 years never saw an ounce of barley. All he saw was manna, but they still knew when to start the year. And that's how they knew they'd been out there for 40 years. Now, if you have any further questions, you can give me a call. Let me give you my telephone number. It's 704-938-6415. If you have any questions, you can call me. Or if you prefer to write, you can go to our uh, uh we, well, you could con look at uh, contact our website address at ambassadorchristiancollege.us. I think you might be able to leave questions there. I'm not sure. You can contact me personally at Ambassador College, and you leave off the final E off the word college because of AOL restrictions. Anyway, it's Ambassador College without the final E at AOL.com, and you can write me a letter and ask me any questions you have about the biblical calendar. So when we observe the Holy Days this year and every year, we're going to do it by the biblical calendar.